Um, now, uh, in this uh, program, in this kind of window, I won't be able to see the total numbers, but I'm sure that the numbers are quite good. I can see some of the bright names like Ashwati and others. So uh, let me share my PowerPoint presentation. We are here to discuss contemporary academic writing in law. Now, what is contemporary about writing and uh, how legal writing in the academic field is not just about publications from the faculty point of view, but also about faculty inculcating possible publications in collaboration with students or from students themselves. And uh, how do we encourage this writing culture in India? I must tell you uh, at the beginning that in India, writing is uh, always a secondary kind of uh, uh, important thing in our academic life because we enjoy our own voice. We love this Aranya Rodan or isolated in the wilderness kind of way of talking. And our culture is, uh, if you look at ancient Indian knowledge systems also, it's more about Smriti and Shruti. And uh, it's also folk culture in the sung tradition where the song gets changed as the authors change or the singer changes or the narrator or the composer changes. So ours is a very vibrant uh, culture uh, which gives a scope for everyone to add their part to the song or the story. If you look at, I mean, I had done a lot of folk uh, story analysis when I was a student of law. So what I'm trying to say is inculcating academic writing means inculcating the discipline of writing. Uh, a writing is a, a writing requires more discipline, more concentration, more effort and more structure and planning compared to speaking. I don't mean to say that in speaking, there's no planning. Suppose I'm talking to you now, uh, we have done extensive research on this theme and then we have come to you. But then when you write, you your brain works in seven other directions. Uh, therefore, writing requires that absolute calm. It requires that absolute contemplative mood. And uh, as the poet Wordsworth uh, said that uh, in the context of poetry says, it is the uh, it is the recollection of emotions. Um, I mean, he, he says that uh, uh, poetry is about emotions recollected in tranquility. So any writing for that matter is that kind of an activity of uh, spontaneous overflow, he says. It's a spontaneous overflow recollected in tranquility. So in legal writing, this overflow may correspond with the legal and non-legal material, scholarly and uh, doctrinal material, uh, empirical uh, social data with the uh, uh, proper legal data like legislation and case law. So how do you recollect them? Do they happen spontaneously? How do you structure that spontaneity? Uh, is that spontaneity coming like... Uh, how inspiration this your famous Malayalam author Tagali Pillai sitting by a coast got is it waiting for the divine inspiration like how Dante or other poets would have written no in legal writing in academic writing we are veering between the elements of right brain and left brain which means between factual understanding and uh, structuring of the data and accumulation of the data and the creative way of presenting it so with my faculty, I discuss uh, many a times about uh, when you put a writing, uh, uh, how do you make it attractive? What kind of title do you give? And when you give the title, how it brings and brings a reader to the uh, 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 to the article. And then uh, thereafter, you should not lose your reader. How do you arrest your reader in terms of human mind? Uh, you know, uh, appeals, it gets, it, it always appeals this uh, structure because our brain is a neural network. So if your writing is chaotic, somebody may read the first page and throw it away. They say very loosely written. There's nothing there. Poor researcher would have put so much effort in gathering that data. But the fact that there is no creativity and aesthetic and beauty, and there is no structure, logical structure, uh, it may miss the bus. So this is exactly what we need to uh, think through today in our rest of the two hours of debate or one hour and 40 minutes of debate. So let me take you through the little presentation I have brought. It's quite extensive, but I want to focus in terms of uh, 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 how exactly or what exactly are the things that, I mean, there are three presentations, so I'll have to. Yeah, so 
can you see my presentation there yes yes ma'am yes ma yeah, yeah yeah thank you yes ma'am so yes. first of all uh, the question that comes to us is what is academic writing that presupposes one more question what is writing now uh, as my bio data read i have enjoyed writing uh, but i have written more uh, with joy creative pieces with punishment kind of feeling when i wrote uh, legal writing because you have to keep your career you have to have publications in your name you have to have your llm with dissertation your phd with the thesis so it was a kind of compulsion for me because it is like you collect materials and weave them into a logic but the fact of being a literature uh, uh, avid literature uh, person um, out of passion i don't have a literature degree but out of sheer interest and passion and talent it really helped me in getting my writing together so there were sayings when i was growing up my teachers used to say reading is the enemy of writing if you read too much then you don't feel like writing if you enjoy reading all the time uh, then you are lost in somebody else's thought and you are mastering that thought and you are getting your uh, vocabulary your structure etc even your lecture material but how do you make it your own material so yesterday a day before i was discussing with my faculty on something called reflective thinking what we call as creative thinking skill it's an intellectual enterprise so because this me told it is contemporary dimensions of legal and academic writing uh, i focused on that but uh, what i didn't put in the slide but i can send you that refined slide is on the thinking that you have to do for academic writing the thinking that i do for literature is creative thinking which i have to wait for inspiration because when you are inspired the words fall in place the beauty comes you are in tune with the nature so that's a kind of state of mind but when you are doing academic writing it's about the thought process without the thought process that writing becomes just an accumulation of things from everywhere so what is that thought process that thought process is called creative thinking which is a very very structured way of thinking so in creative thinking we have got this uh, uh, approach in terms of what is there in the research also uh, selecting the data collecting the data then selecting the data then eliminating the data and finding a proper purpose or objective or research question or hypothesis around which this data is woven in terms of proving it or answering it or addressing it in the arrangement of their data so i will uh, run by you some uh, uh, ideas and uh, let us see so now one little exercise i would request you all to do in the writing process irrespective of whether it is academic or creative writing you take out a pen and paper and then uh, you think of uh, one idea uh, one of the dreams you had few days ago few nights ago most of the time dreams come and when we wake up we forget the dream but i'm sure each one of us will remember one or another dream that we have had because sometimes we get very vivid dreams uh, sometimes these dreams are called lucid dreams because previous day you would have dreamt and next day you revisit that dream so just uh, sit back in next one minute you experience absolute silence and try to recall that dream and on this pa paper start describing that dream without lifting your pen means you may put to full stop comma whatever but you don't stop writing so it is 3 5 by my computer clock you will sit back now reflect on that identify a dream after one minute i'll tell you start writing you'll start writing and for 2 minutes you won't lift your pen you won't stop writing you will just write about that dream and then i say pause okay so it is 3 6 by my computer clock so just sit back quietly and reflect
So our one minute gets over. Now I request you to lift the pen, start writing on paper, simply write till I say two minutes are over, please. One minute over, you have one more minute. So time up. Please pause writing, all of you. Who would like to share what you have written? I request one or two to share what you have written. Anybody enthusiastic? There's no nothing to feel shy. It's your very private, individual uh, talent as well as effort as well as uh, experience. So anybody would like to share? Please. Just read what you have written. There's no good or bad about it. I'll tell you why we do this exercise. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, Priyali, congratulations. You have taken the initiative. Wonderful. Yeah. So, uh... I saw I was giving PhD exams, facing interviews, getting rejected from many of the universities, but I uh, kept on trying and uh, no, finally I, I cracked. From, I want you to read from the paper. How did you write? Yeah, I, I wrote it in this way. I'm reading the paper only, ma'am. Ah, just read. Yeah. Why? I tell you why. Ah. Yeah, I, I wrote that I saw I was giving PhD exams, facing interviews, getting rejected from many universities, but I kept on trying and finally I, I saw that I cracked one of them and this is how my uh, like uh, dream uh, kept on going. Ah, the dream kept on going. So, yeah. really. When you were writing, you didn't stop, you didn't lift your head, you didn't lift your pen and you were writing, okay? Yes, now, did you feel during the course of your writing at some point, you didn't make an effort and it was just flowing? No, two times. I was, I was uh, like, there was some sort of, short of uh, barrier. Like, uh, yes, I was confused between... force yourself, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ma'am, twice. Thank you. Thank you. That is because you are a logical mind, a lawyer's mind. So you want to structure it in a certain way. And um, yes. that flow was uh, being uh, limited by that thought of putting it in order. Like, for example, you said you appeared many. Where did you appear? How did it look like? What was the context? Did you wait for the interview in the lobby? Or were you standing in a queue? So those detailing, you know they will yes. come when you take longer and you try to reflect so anybody else in the group who had a feeling of naturally natural flow two minutes is too less but we have shortage of time anybody who had an experience of writing the first two lines then the line was automatically coming anybody
That is uh, why we ask you to write. Yeah, yeah. If there is anyone, please share the experience. If there is nobody else, I can. Ma'am, uh, I felt like I I can continue writing without lifting my pen, and when you said said to stop, I was forcing me to stop from writing. I I can write continuously without lifting my pen. So can you read what you have written? Uh, Ma'am, the problem is I had written in my mother tongue. I had written in Malayalam. That's okay. I can follow Malayalam. I think most of them can follow. Yeah, please read. That's okay. good. In your mother tongue, you have written, which is very close to your deeper expression. So sometimes some of us who are struggling with vernacular to English, it is advised you write your piece in vernacular outline or whatever, and then you translate it into English. There's nothing wrong. Yeah, go on. Me too. ഞാൻ കുട്ടിയായിരുന്ന കാലം മുതൽ മനസ്സിൽ തോന്നിയിരുന്ന സ്വപ്നങ്ങൾ ഒരു മരണം ആരെന്നോ എന്തെന്നോ അറിയാത്ത ആ മുഖം ഒരു റോഡപകടം എന്നെ അതിലേക്ക് വലിച്ചിഴയ്ക്കപ്പെട്ടത് എന്തിനെന്നറിയില്ല വിരിഞ്ഞുകിടക്കുന്ന നാലുവരി പാത അതിന്റെ നടുവിൽ ഒരു ഡിവൈഡറിൽ ഇടിച്ച് തല ചിതറിപ്പോയ ഒരു ചെറുപ്പക്കാരൻ ആരെന്നറിയാത്ത ആ മുഖം എപ്പോഴും ഞാൻ ഓർക്കുന്നു uh th there is a picturesque way of writing imagine if she was writing in english would she be able to do that very good very good i'm happy so neetu is really tapping on her uh, subconscious mind now all our achievements whether it is in uh, academic field in writing or speaking is about this tapping from the subconscious mind that is so someone else wanted to speak i want boys yeah, also yeah. to speak madam yeah. madam uh, my dream was different yeah go on uh we there is my wife daughter and myself were traveling suddenly some unexpected event took place and in a minute i found myself in a lonely place after some time my wife joined there there was no trace of my daughter we had no idea what happened and next uh, next evening next night we were to travel to trivandrum that is about 220 kilometers away now what i'm saying is not the dream i was to go for a walk then and when i passed by the car i found the front tire flat then i could i, I called a mechanic he came tried to fit the stepney tire that was also flat so i just wondered what would have happened if i had started at 10 o'clock from ernakulam to reach swandram by 2 o'clock with my wife and daughter with the flat tire on the front and the flat tire in the stepney so that is what i would have done very good so did you feel that when you were writing at some point you didn't have to put much effort I did it. I did it because that was in my mind. It was, it was there already. And the minute you tapped it, it was just flowing, right? Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Shashindran, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. That's all. Welcome. Welcome. We'll talk about it. Now, you all got the hint. I'll tell you what is this style of, what is this effort we are making, Shashindran, please. so that is that is a real thing madam we don't take the effort as you said he is the one who talk now when, when you are compelled to do things you will do so i was an administrator for a, exactly so, so we don't know. compel uh, yeah shashindran please yeah ma'am so shashindran so that's my experience on, on my own i won't take initiative but if i am required so in my office also i i was required to write even speeches articles i did but on on my own i did i never did it that except, is a thing except, uh, except for the academic alilam and uh, llb etc so what i am coming to with this this is the kind of exercise which is used um, in uh, this is called writing for empowerment so this kind of writing is used with prisoners with the population which is vulnerable where they use writing as a means of um, transacting or uh, cathartic it's a cathartic experience whereby tap they tap on their mind and they try to bring out the hidden experiences 
so this uh, subconscious mind is connected to two three things one is dream so dream always emerges from this uh, unconscious or subconscious part of the mind second is uh, what you want to forget the most means in your mind so second exercise we give normally is what you want to forget the most and what you remember the most so these three exercises we give in students groups and things like that they start giving a shape to connecting the thought to the act of writing so uh, when you start conscious and you start uh, gearing yourself into writing process it makes you to be mastering this skill of bringing the thought into hand into your paper at some point we tell you not to lift the pen because we want you to get merged with that it's like uh, how we do the meditation so lot of writers have must produce book and uh, they have a different way of uh, connecting their thoughts structuring their thoughts so this is how we align the whole neural network in the brain and we align this process of thinking and writing so i wanted to kick start this whole session with this experiential bit i'm sure all of you can easily connect it to the way as rubin was saying that he was this writing when he was doing he was bringing about his dream and there were there were very moving parts of his child being there his wife being there uh, now if he was doing legal writing uh, more or less the same mind process is involved only thing is in legal writing you have data which are not in the brain but in front of you either in your screen or in your books and then you would have done your uh, gist of the data and then you start mapping their interrelationship now how do we map interrelationship we have a methodology and we have a rigor so this exercise which we did is called as tapping the unconscious it is also called as drawing on the right brain it is a uh, in design organizations or in artistic teams in creative teams they have an ideation room with the colors and lights which always make this uh, what we call as the pineal gland in the brain to uh, move so that is the one which is in the darker i mean it doesn't respond to light it has got the same structure as our eye but it always responds to darkness that's why when you are falling asleep and all they say that switch off all the lights don't keep the blue light because pineal gland is sensitive to blue light your mobile phone etc to be kept away so the deep state of rest the creatives bring them into or semi rest and then they start creating so always remember even if it is academic writing dealing with the academic data and rigor finally the process that works is the process of a writer so hybridizing the two marrying the two is the process that is to be personally done as a requirement or prerequisite for getting into the life of a writer or researcher in deriving or converting our thinking into written pieces or printed pieces or typed pieces i hope that point is made clear to all of you and that experience has been uh, even though for 2 to 3 minutes that experience has been mastered by you now you go and think about uh, the dream uh, diary or you can think about what you want to forget the most or what you want to remember the most i'll give you my experience i was doing a workshop with high school children about uh, 20 years ago almost 20 or 19 years ago there were these high school going children in the scientific camp in a village so i wanted to do this free writing with them and i told them can you recall the incidents which you want to which you remember the most so in that group itself i found children talking about father beating the mother children talking about what they witnessed with the police atrocity children talking about uh, how uh, thief was treated by the local zamindar so these were the things they remembered the most because their minds were tender so i took out these uh, narratives and then i started using them to introduce the law to introduce constitution to introduce rights to introduce remedies to introduce procedures and then i also slowly shifted their pessimistic and painful undertaking on that experience into a kind of more probing and inquiry kind of approach because it was a scientific camp so these are the ways by which we 
as lawyers or as people working with rules and regulations and policy and logic can always uh, connect to this process of expression and in the form of writing. So I also asked those kids, how did you feel after writing? They said, oh, we never got the occasion to talk about it. So we felt good. So this is empowering process. This is freeing process. That's why it's called free writing. It's also called free writing because it is a writing which is not regimented. It is not subject to any kind of what we call as structures or uh, any kind of discipline. So from there, let's move to what we have come to discuss today, which is academic writing. If you are looking at academic writing uh, in relation to this, it's more clear, it's precise, it's focused, it is structured, and it has to be backed up by what we call as data or evidence. And secondly, it is uh, to touch a particular type of reader. I will design my writing to a particular type of journal or a, a, a journal which is uh, uh, only looking at, uh, let us say we have this law and society journal. You can imagine from the title of the journal or by looking at the type of indices that this is the journal which is looking at articles which are to look at relationship between law and society or working of the law in society with specific examples or theories which are defining these and constructing new theories or debating those theories. Suppose I have a journal like Yale Law Journal. What will be the content in Yale Law Journal? For your benefit, I have looked at three topmost journals in the world and their indices in the last issue. Now, I will tell you a law journals index or index. Now, first article in this volume, which came in March, is free world law behind bars. Now, what does it mean? So, a law which is uh, arguing for free world, is it behind bars? See the interesting way of putting the title. Second article, antitrust duty to deal in the age of big tech. Why can't they say that antitrust and Google? They wouldn't say that. Antitrust law to deal in the age of big tech. Similarly, I mean, what they're talking about is how do you deal with the uh, uh, big tech companies like Google and Twitter, etc. in an era of uh, uh, big technology and the antitrust law, how does it respond to it? Is it able to regulate? Now, the other article, uh, is not an article, it's a review. So unwritten law and the old ones out. So it is a kind of book uh, uh, review that is done. Then there is a note, which is a smaller article, which is equalizing access to evidence, criminal defendants and the Stored Communications Act. So what kind of crim cr crime and what kind of criminal procedure comes in, in, in the Stored Communications Act? So it's a specific legislation in the US in which defense is being discussed. Then we have another note, which is about schoolhouse property. So varied type of articles are seen in the index. Now, there is a previous issue of Yale Law Journal, which is talking about wars and history wars and property law and conquest and slavery as foundational to the field. So it's looking at historically how conquest and slavery have changed the landscape of poverty law. In Indian case, we can see this whole Enemy Property Act, which is now being uh, debated by BJP government. Uh, so what happens to the enemy property? So we can get hundreds of ideas when we look at the index of other journals or people writing in other jurisdictions. Bankruptcy gifters or uh, corporate governance reform and sustainability imperative. In Europe, that imperative is there. In India also, now we are looking at climate change law and reducing emission, carbon trading, et cetera. And agency control and internally binding, binding norms in the organizations is another article. And then there is uh, gaps in corporate uh, governance, which was another volume. Neutrality in the international law as a um, concept then uh, uh, they, they were looking at trust law reform. Yesterday, I was guiding uh, our PhD student on death law, I mean, death penalty law. And I came across this whole idea of death penalty abolition movement in Australia, in uh, Japan, and then in America, how these movements were coming and how judges were uh, difficult to deal with because they took longer. The longer they took, the person on the death row had to wait for years. We have another one, very interesting one, and this is coming from which journal? This is coming from uh, Stanford Law Review. Look at the title of the article. 
corporate governance and the feminization of capital. You can imagine uh, the crux of the article is at the start of the 20th century, women made up a small proportion of shareholders in America's publicly traded company. And uh, uh, although the change in the shareholder gender demographics happened gradually, it was evident that uh, before 1929 stock market crash, women shareholders were very less. So this is how uh, we see that women's engagement in capital formation in the corporate era was taken. Similarly, uh, on Fourth Amendment, uh, the oath or affirmation by the police, there is an article. Why I'm giving this to you as examples is to show how scholars in other jurisdictions think and why Yale Law Journal, why Stanford? I'll now give you from Harvard and then I'll tell you why. Look at the Harvard Law Journal. This law journal has come in April 22. All the articles, I'll tell you, first article is about local prosecution in the era of climate change. Second one, indigenous interpretations invoking the third Indian canon to combat climate change. About how indigenous populations have their philosophy of climate change. Then state preemption of local zoning laws as intersectional climate change policy. Mandate versus movement, state public service commissions and their evolving power over energy resources the promise and perils of carbon tariffs. So it seems like entire journal issue is dedicated to climate change law. So why I took these three journals? We have in the law field, not too many journals, but not too less also. However, among these thousands of journals, not many are figuring in the scopus with the UGC is insisting, which now NAC is insisting. Law journals are very few in the Scopus database. Now, with, among those law journals, if you see, the highest index as well as the highest uh, ranked journals are these three. Topmost is Stanford. I told about the feminization of capital. Second one is Harvard, which one issue is fully dedicated to climate change. And then the Yale and Columbia and others come later on. So why these journals are quality journals? What qualifies as content in this journal? Um, what are the general types of articles which come in these journals? If you see, it's very um, clear. Can I interrupt for a minute? Um, uh, the slides are not moving. We are still in the first. No, I didn't uh, move the slide. I'm not moving the slide. I'm not moving the okay. slide because I'm All explaining right. to you uh, why academic writing is to be, uh, uh, I mean, your topic. I mean, why it is to be contemporary and how it is contemporary. Yes, so Sorry. these three examples will show you what is honored in the contemporary era in legal scholarship. Now, what is honored in contemporary? I'll be coming to that later on. So uh, academic writing, as we indicated here, it moves from a particular purpose and it depends on the readers. So if you are looking at topmost journals in the Scopus database of law, like Stanford, Harvard or Yale, then you know that the readers are also looking up to such standards and the articles have to cater to such kind of expectation. So readers understanding is very important. Formal tone and style, as I told you with these examples, and it is it, it uses uh, uh, long sentences, but not very long. It, there is no need to use very complicated vocabulary and uh, writing conventions and the set of words and types of discourse vary from discipline to discipline generally speaking in academic writing. So what are the characteristics? They are planned, they are focused, they are structured, they have a data, as I told you, current legislation may be there, data of uh, past and present showing how many women uh, shareholders have been there. And then uh, the evidence is based, uh, uh, the evidence that is used there is with the references and the references are cited in a consistent manner, whether it is Harvard Blue Book citation, method or Oscola method or uh, what we call as American Psychological Association style of method. Uh, so it is it's a tone is very, very formal. It is a it is a uh, what we call as a, it has got that scholarly tone. Therefore, academic writing has to have these characteristics. One is it's complex. It has got it has mind mapped to different layers. There will be an introduction. There will be a conclusion. In between, there will be literature review and there will be objective 
and that objective being translated into different parts of the article in each part corresponding information in the form of either empirical data from the society or from the stakeholders or in the form of library based case laws or legislation or interpretation or juristic opinions being cited am i making it clear so this is how uh, an article looks like so there is complexity there is formality there is precision precision means title and the body and the uh, approach should be corresponding there is objectivity means you nobody says today morning when i woke up uh, i did not have sugar in the sugar box we don't tell subjective personal stories we refer to uh, the phenomenon or matter which is under discussion there is detailing explicitness there is hedging we structure it in such a way that uh, certain information is selected certain information is eliminated so that kind of hedging is done there is a responsible writing whereby we don't uh, disclose anybody's privacy we don't impinge upon anybody's right to be uh, withholding their identity confidentiality and uh, we we don't treat the vulnerable in an objective manner we make we bring their opinions we bring their uh, views with the highest responsible and respectable manner and there is accuracy the years and everything we don't tell uh, stories and then we organize it in a particular way as i told you and before that we plan it uh, with an abstract with an outline and after we finish the article we again change the abstract so these are the general characteristics so if you look at academic writing triangle the general one is understanding the task of writing planning it and uh, mm, and planning it and identifying the purpose according to the plan what could be purposes purposes could be uh, you may be as a teacher generating an assignment for an undergraduate student you may be generating an assignment for a postgraduate student normally we do seminars and then you may be generating it for a phd student now in each level it differs you know why it differs we have this bloom's taxonomy of learning which where uh, at the undergraduate level we are more into students understanding the concepts and them being able to recall the concept so it will be descriptive writing where they put lot of data and the way they organize and they may give one or two reflective opinions about it their agreements or disagreements about it and um, they may substantiate it or support it with an author's uh, uh, edited article uh, so that student is the a grade student or a plus or outstanding student when that student is able to reach the next level so from the level of comprehending understanding and recalling we go to the level of analysis we go to the level of uh, uh, what we call as critical thinking which is more into uh, generating your own approach to knowledge so a student reads 10 then that student is putting those 10 in the hand and he is able to categorize them he categorizes or she categorizes based on certain theory or based on what is similar what is dissimilar which is the best which theory it supports now that requires higher order thinking and at the higher order thinking level is where post graduate should be assessed so when you are designing an assignment you ask complicated questions in terms of different data aligning different theories coming in which means you yourself should be reading well as well not expecting students to read and come are making students to do some part of your uh, teaching in the post graduate my teachers used to say this is a textbook and they would teach the basics and then they would say you do your assignment and then they would assess us on the basis of the quality of assignment we brought and the seminar presentation we did but what i designed later on by understanding best practices was that i would teach in each module uh, outline concepts and then i would generate questions or propositions which the student had to investigate and i would give one or two references for that so my entire modules i will divide into a set of questions and make students motivate them to ask their own set of questions or split those questions and find their answers so at the masters level from comprehension understanding and recall it goes to the level of analysis and creating categories of analysis and critiquing and then it goes to the level of creating knowledge how do you create knowledge that is the creative one and in 
rendering a new way of thinking through such creation is the innovation. So in a discipline like law, innovation could be recommending a new law, innovation could be recommending a new model, or it could be recommending a new process or a toolkit of training. So that creation, to that level, we expect a PhD student to go to, in a small form, even an LLM, if they do that, you should honor them. So this is how academic writing, as a teacher, when you are assigning, you should correspond it with what NAC nowadays calls as program outcome and course outcome. So in the larger undergraduate program, we define law students to have the capacity to identify the law, to apply the law, to understand the legislations, to do a case analysis, to do a legislative analysis, and to simulate the situations, real life situations, and then bring them in the mock trial or moot court format. Ability to stand up and speak and communicate cogent legal perspectives. So this is the undergraduate outcome, which means they have to be thorough in the knowledge. But in the postgraduate, we go one level above. They have to have values. They have to create knowledge. They should be able to write opinions, independent opinions. And when we go to PhD, the same will be done in an advanced manner, including creation and innovation. So do you think I have made it clear? Therefore, when you are generating assignments in terms of academic writing, please don't forget the level of students whom you are addressing and generating it. My opinion, if you go by these advanced countries like IB system, which India's ancient Gurukula system also spoke about, and uh, Cambridge system, students are taught to do the observe the reality and use a survey form and uh, uh, compute the data from sixth standard itself. We in our law schools in undergraduate days, this is why National Law School started the whole idea of project-based assessment. Because students were forced to uh, look at the library data and then go to the field, talk to people, or understand. Nowadays, with online materials, with the website, website is a real-life reflection. One can always identify the data and arranging those data in a particular manner. So project is about that something which is actualizable, which you can actualize, which could be highly uh, high level uh, thinking thought process with critique and uh, with the counter analysis and analysis are expected so when we are doing academic writing we may be first level understanding the task which level we are assigning it to or we ourselves are we publishing an article and then we come to the section of the proposal where we talk about the phenomenon, how many people are affected, how many incidents have happened, how many cases have come before the court, literature review, what other authors have written about it, what they did not write about, which methodology you are using. So that is the structure. And then you talk about the sources of information or data, and then referencing which references you have used. And then we have sentence levels in terms of grammar, punctuation, clarity the way in which you have organized the thought, the transition between paragraphs, subheadings, so or in PhD between chapters and within chapter, the paragraphs. So this is how academic writing with the purpose, form, structure, using date, and the language or sentence level. Now in legal writing, we may be using legal writing in the academia or uh, part of teaching assessment. And uh, here, when we are using, maybe uh, using a range of techniques from the field, uh, uh, if we see their way of writing, then law will get enriched. For example, economic analysis of law. Uh, uh, Posner, Richard Posner started this whole approach, and they had applied this economic analysis to show how of tort law cases, the way the compensation was computed, the factors. Uh, emphasis on different factors like age, productivity, utility, gender, matter. In India, for girls, uh, girl victims, what amount of compensation was given? For boys, what amount of compensation was given whenever they were victims of a motor vehicle accident? Also is an interesting study. So this is where in legal writing, other disciplines have enriched. For example, sociological approach. I have read a study about the narratives of sex workers in Calcutta's red light area being brought into uh, a legal ethnography 
team by Prabha Koteshwaran, who is a professor in London School uh, in uh, King's College, London. So sociological approach of sociometry has been used in conjunction with the law to show how law has addressed the issue of immoral traffic or uh, 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 the trafficking of uh, human trafficking for sex work purposes. So professors of law have used anthropological approaches uh, where they have gone and studied populations in Far East islands. Uh, one of the authors uh, who was uh, uh, Simon Roberts, he talked about in uh, Polynesian island, how the tribals used to resolve their disputes. So he talked about different methodologies like good office, mediation, which became the precursor of modern industrial disputes uh, resolution techniques. So you can use an approach, sociological approach, linguistics, for example, law and literature is a field by itself, which is very, very rich. Therefore, for us, the value of legal research and writing is both in the profession and in our academia. And uh, pedagogy of legal writing is not just restricted to articles and uh, uh, essays. It is also going forward in terms of teaching students how to write a moot memorial, how to write um, uh, first of all, how to uh, look at uh, an instance and make it into a claims drafting exercise. For example, I have an instance, uh, one of my American friends who came here, she's the legal writing professor in symbiosis on visit, and she visited my flat and she saw a neighbor carrying, I mean, uh, uh, leashing a dog, walking with the dog. And then uh, she, uh, she saw the other neighbor coming and yelling at her, yelling at her pets in the residential area without the permission. So she developed this problem of uh, conflict between neighbors and uh, the rights of the animal and then uh, the duties of the keeper of the animal. See, it is coming very much closer to distant uh, damage, uh, fee sent in uh, tort law, or it is coming to the question of chattel. It is coming to the question of animal prevention of cruelty to animal accommodation of animals as uh, the whole jurisprudence of animal as the subject and the object of law. So she gave this story and she challenged students to draft the claim. The claim on the part of the keeper of the dog, the claim on the part of the neighbor who opposed it, and then the arguments in favor of them and the legal dimensions of it. So can you think of that kind of an exercise for the students? So uh, the claim is not just a plaint, it is also having a point of law, so then they had to develop it into a moot memorial, and then they had to moot on behalf of these two uh, fighting neighbors. So this is how we are developing this legal writing. We had uh, also another very interesting case which we brought. The case was a case of an animal which escaped from the forest, and then it was found by somebody, and that finder goes and gives it to the zoo, and then uh, the uh, afterwards, the one uh, the, the animal was uh, so good that she would eat from the hand of anybody who fed her. Um, and then they uh, then they came to know that this animal belonged to somebody um, who was into animal rescuing. So who becomes the better owner? Is it the zookeeper or the rescue organization which had taken it from the forest? And then it had kept it, and again the animal escaped. Animals have a tendency to escape. But then they hadn't collared the animal. So those are the factual issues. To establish title, it's not easy. So uh, jurisprudentially, how this story can be looked at. So as academics, we can convert any story into jurisprudential story by bringing that crucial fact and then challenging students into that kind of thing. So in writing, while writing, uh, uh, for journals or while creating challenging students to write, uh, students to do the academic writing as part of assignment, as part of practical training, how these stories can be converted into a legally debatable or mute story, moot stories, moot means debatable, moot stories is what we can think about. I hope I made that kind of part clear. So this part is corresponding with generic academic writing in the contemporary reflection and then how they can become part of a teacher's life in terms of inculcating such writing as part of evaluation process, as part of establishing program outcome and their usage in the practical life as lawyers or as scholars. 
now i will take you to uh, the kinds of legal writing Mm, uh, we can look at legal writing, which is about preventing a dispute, which may be making an appeal to the authorities or mediation and settlement. So that is one type. Second is predictive legal writing, where uh, we are uh, looking at, uh, 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 you know, forestalling uh, the future disputes or injuries or recovery. So these are all coming in the form of lawyers drafting. So you have a course on drafting, right? Then we have persuasive legal writing, which uh, uh, we use most of the times uh, in terms of when we are doing law reform research. I mean, that is the part uh, I always try to give lectures on, where we are persuading with evidence how the current law is lacking by bringing data from the stakeholders. And then we are uh, suggesting which provision is inadequate, why? And we are suggesting what are the new possibilities, how the new provision or law should look like. So this is a persuasive legal writing. Therefore, whenever we are doing such writing, the purpose of the research behind this writing might have a direct linkage with who is writing. So I gave you the example of making students write. That means teachers and students. The purpose is to uh, uh, achieve the course or program outcome. But uh, in private legal practice, the purpose is to serve the interest and expectation of the client and to get justice to the client's version of rights. In lawyers in government or private sector, fulfilling their purposes. Law reform agencies persuading a change in the law. Those assisting parliamentary committees and commissions to give a, give a better understanding of law. And judges, teachers of law, writers, NGOs, they may be giving an exposition of law. In case of judges, it is to resolve the dispute. Or these retired judges who become arbitrators or commissioners, they may be giving a viewpoint in those cases, again, in solving a problem. So why do we do this? We, we, we may be doing it to solve a problem, to argue a case, to draft a legislation, to advise a client, to review the law, to look at the inadequacies of the law, or to make recommendation for new law to reform or amend. Or we may be preparing law books or we may be doing it for the purpose of academic uh, uh, assignments to score marks as part of internal or external. Uh, in PhD, it is external, you see the uh, dissertation or the thesis. So wide variety of purposes are being used when we do the research for such writing. It is to ascertain the nature of law, or it is to even to look at if that rule is serving a per particular situation. Like, for example, we have uni uniform civil code in Goa, but that uniform civil code in Goa, how many people are using? Because Goa's landscape changed once the Portuguese left. So looking at the utility of this uniform civil code and its uh, relevance to the entire India, and then uh, how exactly is it reflecting the current realities? And is it really making change in the lives of women who are mostly affected by these religion-based personal laws? We may be looking at such issues in case of children, in case of farmers, climate change or environment, international law. And we may also in our scholarly writing examine the law established by the courts to determine how far that case law is relevant and um, what are the different approaches that judges have used. We can evaluate that. And we can also look at the legislative law which is applicable in the situation to determine the character of the law. Now, wide variety of purposes which are there in the research is the lookout of general researchers who are present here for PhD, or it may be for your book or publication, or even for teaching purposes. So we have wide variety of ways of approaching it in looking at the advantage, disadvantage, looking at conflicts which are present, what caused the law to come in the first place, or even to discover new facts and challenge the law and show that law is not adequate. Like, for example, you know, during COVID-19, we realized that our existing disaster management uh, laws and uh, pandemic-related laws, uh, the Epidemic Act, they were inadequate because there was a concurrent jurisdiction of union government and state government impinging upon it. Different states had different outcome in managing the situation, whether it is Kerala or Maharashtra or Government of India's approach. So there were deviations from government of India's approach, which were adapted to the local situation. And in the COVID uh, wave two, 
uh, government of India uh, was imposing activities which resulted in uh, escalation of cases and the government of India's policy in not allowing other types of vaccines being openly available in India resulted in more deaths. So, or I wouldn't say resulted because I don't have evidence, but coincided with the reality of more deaths. So, a lot of questions were raised. So, finally, one issue of education, how it was handled during COVID-19. It will be a very interesting subject matter of uh, research, not only within the institution in terms of our pedagogy switching over to online, examination switching over to online, student participation, um, and then the most uh, uh, telling thing was term and examination. How did the students experience in the state government, uh, uh, state universities? How did they explain, experience it in central universities? How exactly was their experience in private universities, national law schools? Very, very different. I mean, I was admitting students for LLM based on expected results. And then their results didn't come till they finished their first semester. Because state governments were waiting for the nod from the uh, uh, from uh, state uh, colleges were waiting for the nod from their university. University was not willing to go with the UGC. Yeah, then uh, there was conflict in the understanding between university and the students. Then they tapped the doors of the court, and the courts again said that on this matter UGC's uh, uh, opinion we will take. UGC creates a committee of some professors who did not think about the students uh, from the student perspective and the kind of traumatic situation uh, students have undergone. They declared that examination should be offline. You know, when the two waves were uh, hitting on the face. So much of critique of these things are definitely something that could be a subject matter of research, which showed us that academic writing hasn't been keeping pace with these critiques. So I had written a couple of pieces on human rights, uh, on gender and COVID. So at that time, we looked at different legislations and different international human rights standards, how they were uh, interacting and how they were falling short during the migrant crisis and other things. So uh, I'm giving these examples to show you how purpose of research may be to evaluate the approach of the law. So when we are doing a book review, I saw, I showed you the review articles. Every journal has got a review article. So you can explain the book. You can evaluate the book by using certain theory, or you can evaluate the book by using perspectives related to the theme of the book. And then uh, you can describe the book and you can show the relevance of the book and you can end it with your opinion about the overall impact of the book or the gaps that are left by the book. So book review is one, and then uh, we can even look at uh, uh, you know, studies which are related to a problem like migrant crisis, as I told you, or uh, treatments uh, which are experienced by elderly people during that crisis, and um, many other health and law related interfaces, public health and law related interfaces could be coming in. Now coming to uh, quality of good writing. Good legal writing has three quality CCE, clarity, conciseness, means not lose, wearing away passages, and engaging. As I told you, the title should be attractive. The uh, style should be attractive. It should be logically moving because human mind always responds better to the symmetry. Our brain is uh, symmetrical and uh, it is uh, into many networks. So anything which is disjunct, where the connection is missing, we find it of less quality. So make it engaging by making it uh, coherent, logically flowing, you know. And uh, uh, when we are doing planning of the writing, we have to read and analyze, and then we create a, an outline, and then uh, uh, we create a draft by filling that outline and the segments, and then uh, we will convert it into a good design looking at the reader. At that stage, you look at the reader, is this easy? So loudly you read, you imagine yourself as a reader and don't fall in love with your work at that stage and then edit for style, technical reason, plagiarism, etc. So always, I mean, I give this understanding, you know, you have to decode the title uh, so that you, when the teacher gives you a title or you as a teacher, when you are giving a title to the students, you design that postulation or title in such a way that there is enough scope for questioning, for thinking, for mapping the idea. 
so while writing we have to do this mind map and then uh, we we as teachers we give instructions and as writers we have to look at that instruction we have meister mind meister software or app which is available on the web you can download and you can uh, map it in terms of key idea then sub idea then sub sub idea and then that is linked to that mind meister which can come as part of your article when you are trying to explain a concept in the second part of your article so they will help generate ideas before you make a formal plan then you can use it as a raw material mind map can be in two forms one is in the flow chart form and the other can be a tree form so in tree what is happening you have a trunk of the tree and the branches are emerging in the flow chart what happens there is an idea which leads to another idea and it may lead to sub sub, sub, -sub ideas so this way you can mind map your core concept and develop concepts around that so this kind of mind mapping uh, decodes the title and develops the idea into plots and subplots or subtopics and whenever you are using the title you can use in bhd thesis they say an evaluative study an analytical study a descriptive study or a critical study critical study is evaluative study only critical evaluation that is like a double bonanza uh, you are finally you are doing evaluation only pros cons comparison but you are talking about it in emphatic way then uh, what are the in the title you always should have these kinds of suggestive words which will give the reader a uh, clue about what is expected in the body therefore title you first uh, when you prepare the abstract you prepare the title but afterwards you revisit and if it is not fully reflecting what you have written then you narrow down in phd we don't have that freedom after the topic is confirmed you are not allowed to change the title so what you can do is in the introduction chapter in the scope and limitation you can say that with reference to the title the scope is limited only to this it covers this it does not cover this so or the word there for example i did biodiversity convention conservation but i said in my thesis that this is limited to the plant breeding because biodiversity will include plants and animals so in my scope and limitation i said that for the purpose of this research this is limited to plant breeding and plant genetic resources so this is how so i was going on with the case of ip and all that now you can look at your title uh, like analyze contrast um, uh, the extent you can say 1957 to 1920 judicial journey of the concept of uh, let us say now what is coming in uh, third gender uh, uh, a judicial trajectory, uh, a judicial trajectory, uh, 2012 to 22. Then you say this decade, first time it was just mentioned, then it was defined, then it was uh, in the rights of uh, healthcare, uh, subsequently uh, in uh, Naujot Singh uh, Johar and other, Naujot Singh Johar and other cases, how they define these rights and the idea of privacy was brought in and in the right to privacy judgment again it is revisited and now a comprehensive legislation. So here you can, uh, uh, you can use the process in terms of discussing, analyzing, comparing, a comparative analysis can be there or a, a comparative approach can be there. So the title indicates the kind of approach you have taken so planning while planning the writing uh, uh, if you are planning the length of the piece let us say you plan a 6000 word a decent uh, piece a full article is 6000 short article is between 3000 to 4000 a note is between 1000 to 3000 case note nobody wants to read the case uh, more than 3000 words because it is only a fragment of law you can always connect it to the past legislation future implications impact analysis etc but what is expected of a case note is that iraq analysis issues rules analysis and conclusion so here uh, you have to use some primary sources and some references so your writing has got introduction, conclusion in between the bodies there. And in the body, you have literature review, 
in the body you have the objectives or postulations or arguments or propositions mentioned and then in the body you are analyzing them with the support of the data with tables with the interview uh, details or qualitative analysis or simply description with the doctrinal data with the support of case laws and comparative provisions now this kind of planning your legal writing is something and uh, here you have to research asking certain questions when i was uh, developing this symbiosis law school uh, contemporary law journal which was published with Elsevier, that is uh, uh, LexisNexis. The technique that our editor uh, advisor gave us was divide it into questions and try to find answers to the questions. And the questions are always Ws and Hs. So what is the author's argument? How good is the evidence for the argument? Is it convincing evidence? Which of them is the convincing evidence? Which of them is not? What are the flaws in the evidence? I mean, here evidence means data, which is case laws or provisions. Uh, what would I like to ask the author? So you yourself are uh, questioning yourself. What are the implications? Which theory is proved or disproved? What examples are in the counter analysis or in the opposite theory? What are the solutions or alternatives you are giving? Because every article is also progressing in the line of question answer or problem solution. Any human, uh, knowledge is innovative piece is about designing a solution. That solution could be in the form of a model, it could be an answer to the question, or it could even be pointing to how to approach the solution. For example, when 498A was being debated, it was not only about repealing, arguing for repealing 498A, deleting, that would be a lethal to India. Uh, or about amending 498 and diluting its rigor by making it uh, bailable, etc. It is all it as it is, but designing certain investigative devices through which its misuse is prevented or overuse is prevented or excess of power by the police is prevented. So this is how we think when we are developing the research. So you make notes concise notes, you should keep a separate sheet of paper or on computer, a separate window should be open where you are skimming because never your first draft is the perfect draft. It is always your fifth draft, which is the perfect draft. Therefore, while making this uh, uh, paragraph, see some of the phrases in contemporary writing, we have culled out of many articles. It's a question that can only be answered by, you don't say this is the answer. See the way in which phrases are used. At this point, I always use, you know, further, furthermore. So we need at this point to go back briefly. So you are interlinking the previous patch. We have only examined this. You are raising the curiosity for the next one. Uh, before saying that I will explain this, this helps to explain why. Or um, the contrasting view is brought. On the contrary, the author X. Or... Uh, uh, when you're uh, using somebody else's literature, you're telling that this reads this way. However, this reading lacks this or it does not explain this. And between many readings, you'll say what is the most important and why is it important? And uh, explaining a model and you think about it, we can see that summarizing it. A significant implication in the sense theory, you are summarizing it. You are distinguishing it. So this distinguishing, contrasting, skimming, these are all critical thinking. That is the originality of an author, not simply getting data, but recollected in tranquility. Spontaneous overflow recollected in tranquility. So this is where reflection comes in. This is where the originality and innovation in contemporary academic writing comes from. And demonstrating it to your reader is very important. Now we have done all that and then we are writing so many pages and so many paras. So how do you link the paras? Furthermore, moreover, additionally, nonetheless, similarly, in contrast, this is how you link one para to the other. Many times, you know, it appears so hodgepodge from somewhere some para comes. The idea is the tail is here, head is here. This is why thinking, 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 revising, revising, revising. So one is latest law should be captured. Second is latest references. Third is these references into the highly cited, highly respected sources. Suppose you cite something like Stanford, Harvard, or any other Scopus-based, even human rights quarterly from Europe. 
these will be guaranteeing you are writing to be published in scopus so these are all the tricks of the trade that uh, well published authors use so up to date information up to date development of the law don't skip recent case law so what i do after my researchers finish their phd thesis terms their doctrinal or uh, it's mandatory for them to go to minimum 100 stakeholders these stakeholders in law are very easy nac has given us that which is litigants which is lawyers which is judges which is government ministries and then uh, retired judges if the sitting judges are not willing to talk then youth who may uh, ethically you should not use your own students or colleagues you may use from some other general milieu so six or seven types of stakeholders divide the 100 it will come to 15 20 it won't be huge numbers so you design a questionnaire and you test the conclusions that you have drawn on the basis of library research and to your surprise, you will see many judges giving you the latest case law compared to what you think is the latest because they worked with it and they are habitually getting into it. Whereas you are doing it only when you are teaching that subject. You may not be knowing in its interface with the other subjects. So this is the advantage of validating your conclusions with the stakeholders. And when you are doing uh, research projects, this is required more because a project is an action with the research. It's an application. Therefore, when you're getting grants and funds, now you got the stride fund, you should have your feedback. That is action, impact. Similarly, you should show your attendance. So when we are doing a project with the same research, if I'm doing a project, I will create a teaching device for the judges, or I will do a workshop or dissemination roundtable where I will take opinions and incorporate it into my report as a chapter. So this is how your research should be uh, taking its revisions by updating itself, by taking uh, latest feedback, by involving other stakeholders. So we have something called plagiarism. UGC has clearly told it should be nothing uh, more than 10% uh, ideally, but 10 to 15%. So we make them go through Turnitin software, and then we try to look at it in terms of uh, what we call as uh, 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 rephrasing it, re-paraphrasing it in avoiding it. So learning the technique of paraphrasing, as we told earlier, is very important, not to copy paste, but to think about it and write about it. You can cite it, you can quote it with 20 to 40 words wherever relevant. Now, why should you publish as an academic? You should public publish for promotion, you should publish as a result of more than teaching higher order thinking skill, thinking about it in terms of critical thinking and to create new knowledge. And it is also for the personal satisfaction of becoming visible and keeping your interests recorded. So we have in our uh, UGC and in our university, a student professor should have a minimum of two Scopus slash WS. There are many other journals also in Web of Science and then associate professor and professor. And we do co-authorship with the PhD students and LLM students. Every LLM dissertation is a potential source of at least three articles. You can have a review article from the literature review. You can have data analysis article in terms of March of the law. If there is empirical and critical evaluation, that can be another knowledge-based article. So when we are publishing, we are a, a publishing strategy for a teacher. As a teacher, if you want to enhance your publication, you have to have that determination where you set a goal. In my one semester, I will attend only for a minimum of two seminars and I will convert my seminar papers into writing. Or I will work with my previous year's LLM dissertation student and publish one of them as my co-author. So don't wait for someone to order you, your university or others. So do it out of your happy uh, self-motivated drive and then the partnership you can have partnership with your guide or with your colleague you can mentor each other by reading your pieces then you need skills like this only attending trainings and reading reading is the superpower and faculty development program and getting inspiration from writings of people as i gave you the example upendra bakshi and other people and then perseverance not to give up just write your outline and then don't forget, make it a practice. Have that uh, alarm in your mobile phone, at least daily five minutes. This is the daily 20 minutes 
uh, for a PhD candidate or researcher gives a better result than once a month, uh, one hour, or uh, once a week, one hour. I mean, our PhD students still that university says, I'll uh, remove you from the candidate list, don't seem to write even 50%. But uh, if there is that systematic way of working, then the outcome is better rather than working in chunks. So when you have to publish, I am uh, repeating what we have said, formulate your idea, formulate the research problem within that idea or the question within that idea, do adequate literature review, do what other authors have done, put a framework, introduction, body and conclusion and split them and put them on a paper from day one only and then revise them with more research. So if you are writing, then what are the steps? From what we have studied so far, first is developing the skills of legal method and analysis. That's not my mandate. I'm sure Bismi, uh, Professor Bismi would have uh, given this mandate to others. I would request her that have a session on how to do a case analysis, how to do a legislative analysis, how to do a law reform research, because these are the researches which pass off as original research and a um, lot of our law reform research has focused on amendment to the law. They have been published in Cambridge and Oxford statute review because statute review uh, separate journals exist in a very reputed academic space. I'm not looking at Indian journals. I mean, they are okay with the UGC list. Maybe state universities recognize the UGC list, but the universities like ours who are looking at international benchmarking and QS ranking and all, we are not happy with the UGC alone. We insist, as I told you, on Scopus. So for those original writings, especially in these uh, statute law reviews, etc., are very important. And then you have to research the law related to that area. Don't forget it's legal research. So what is law there? Legislation is law. Interpretation is law. Uh, case laws are law. So you do pre-writing, which is abstract writing and outline. Then you actually write. Then you revise. Then you revisit. So these are the six phases. But I told you five drafts only make the research uh, complete. So I'm not talking, uh, repeating about legal research. I will come to uh, quality. Teaching and research, I'll just quickly touch. It is your research which makes your teaching lively. Always try to uh, go updating yourself. It contributes to advancement of your learning and students learning. It stimulates more research and your research while you teach should be sound and publishable. And it's a, it's an investigation where you don't subjectively involve, even you, though you may hold leftist viewpoint or rightist viewpoint. It's not about that. It's investigating if my viewpoint is right, it is supported by others, which kind of citations are in my favor, which are against me and how do I refute it? See, ours is academic freedom. We are not political that way. We cannot be apolitical either, but uh, we have that academic freedom in terms of holding, refuting, dis dissecting, and disagreeing regarding political views. So it's an honest, dispassionate investigation. It's not to be confined to library. Please visit some respondents or do some website analysis. I had come across a research which had done the website analysis of five companies in a particular jurisdiction to show how CSR is reflected there. Another study I saw was just studying the missions of corporate bodies through their websites and talking about how did they correspond with the sustainable development goals. So new, new researchers are emerging in the new fields. I will tell you about that. So the type of data that you have and then uh, the kind of questions that you use. Don't have 100 questions. Nobody has the patience. Maximum 25. And uh, use your tool of analysis. You can use Google uh, Sheet because you can connect to scholars or respondents all over. Don't miss your ethical compliances. So while developing an academic piece of writing, other than what you use in teaching as assignment, find a problem, do your research, create an outline, test suite, identify your question or statement, write an introduction. While writing the introduction, give the background and explanation, prove your claim, prove your argument or analyze your argument. And then uh, while following you, do the citation rules properly. 
then connect to the bigger issues like theories or global points, comparative points, and do the counter analysis, what is not fitting in, and then edit, edit, edit. That is the summary for contemporary academic writing. Now, every article, please imagine, it's like a small LLM dissertation or a PhD dissertation. Therefore, when you do this, you always see that you refine your draft and then also look at your career, look at the good journals in terms of how visibility is there. And then also your own happiness, your career, your employer means in our case, we have to please our employer who is very strict. Now, when you are converting your uh, thesis or uh, your uh, dissertation into journal article, yeah, the main difference is thesis or dissertation is for academic requirement for your degree and the select committee members only review it, your uh, examiners, and it has got chapters. It is quite lengthy, although sometimes there are word limits. Some universities don't define 80,000. Then there is table of content, etc. When you are converting it into general article, journal article, that journal standards and style you have to meet. It's a team. I told you law and society journal versus human rights quarterly. So you know the theme. And uh, there they will review with blind authors. You will have sections, you will have word limits, you will have a format for the manuscript, you will have uh, uh, literature. They will ask you to say how many citations of the previous writings in this area you have used. And International Research Board, uh, I mean, you have to write a broad uh, research uh, abstract to be uh, described with the international standards in one to three sentences means keywords and uh, your uh, uh, overview in the research and uh, uh, information which is used should be in a succinct format and you have to give your select findings and fairly consistent in terms of verb and sentence verb and tense must agree we can't say that they says or she say we have to say she says they say so verb tense uh, agreement should be fairly consistent. Uh, so you have to identify target journals. We have given you broad uh, sources like SkyMag is a very high standard and their impact factor and uh, in which quartile, means, means in Scopus, you all know there are four quartiles, one, two, three, four. Scopus one quartile article is equivalent to four of the Scopus four article. So you publish in Scopus 1. One of my colleagues published in Scopus 1. He was writing on religion and law in the Oxford Journal. So it's possible, uh, but uh, he had to undergo seven reviews. Seven times he had to change the core tone of the article. So some of the journals may demand money. It is not exorbitant, but it is uh, they call it as article processing charges, which is definitely there even in databases, there's a fees. So you can have multiple chapters converted into articles. Uh, it's very important for you to find the journal and find the proper keyword because that is the one which is going to assure your target readers. And then uh, you always rewrite the introduction. You always rewrite the abstract also. And then uh, you always uh, rewrite the title as well once you finish the article because as the data emerges, as you have done the uh, gist, you will see that uh, it is going to change. So I, I don't want to repeat. Mm, now I'll tell you how do we review our own article or others article. So we read the entire document and then we correct the language. And then we see how the information is presented through the ideas. And then we focus on one line. So first we do general for language. And then we see how the information is wholly present. We may do the sketch. And then we see each line and check the logical flow of sentences. And then we look at the methodology. I used to review JNU thesis and I used to see they claim some methodology in one or two cases. And they don't use that methodology. And then uh, uh, suitability to the title, the motivation and the conduct of the article, how enthusiastically it is written, how clearly it is written. And how is the argument logical? Is it from general to specific? Is it using a theory and using uh, revisiting that theory with the data? Or is it developing a theory out of the data? So what kind of argument is used? And then we go to what kind of citation methods, whether latest articles are used in the citation and uh, are those citations and the content in the article matching? You are not simply marrying, uh, they say that uh, 
one item from somewhere, another item from somewhere. So when we finally edit our article, we look at fundamental one, as we already told, then we do the structural one, then we do the content, then we do the stylistic one, then we proofread, which we have already told, and then we engage the peers. So in our case, we have used these best practices, LLM dissertations and internship. We students intern with us, especially during COVID, they couldn't find industry internship. So we did the 300 students online internship, which resulted in 30 articles only. But there are many materials which are lying there. High plagiarism we didn't use. Identify reviewers. So we always do internally. Uh, even the senior uh, uh, professors articles, juniors may review. Presenting reviewers comment because, you know, we have this friend who was in the Nobel Committee, Bert Landesen, a Swedish guy who was the president of uh, Singapore Management University. He told one thing, gazelles run fast, means younger the researcher is, the faster they are in reading and publishing. It's a human capacity. Of course, some of us may retain it with practice, but uh, generally gazelles are always faster. So incorporating journals, reviewer comment after the comment is coming is also important. So my suggestion, create a little group before you all depart from this stride FDP, find your mutual interest, uh, float the topics, and then see who is interested in that field. If you ask me today, the most publishable articles come from interface between climate change and other areas. Climate change can be connected to energy. It can be connected to business. It can be connected to constitution, to international law, to the to women, to children. So that could be one. The other is generic goal of sustainable development goals in which we have access to justice. We have equality, gender equality as one of the important things. There are 13 goals like nutrition, food, transport. So related to that, then we have the most important or evergreen area, which is constitutional law and the human rights law. So you can connect any field to that field. Other than that, you can see the trajectory of judicial decisions around it has changed over the years, how the judicial uh, conclusions are having a fallacy or unreasonableness or impact of judgments, post judgment impact, disagreement between or dissension between different judgments or dissenting judges' opinions evolving into the law later on, or judges' opinion evolving into the impact analysis is done in that sense. So these are some of the areas. As far as India is concerned, contemporary phenomena which are coming are economic reconstruction, new debates on center-state relations, aside from other things, and the one is emerging. The whole lot of technological developments like artificial intelligence, the development of the media, because India is having a very good cultural intellectual property rights, because India is constantly harping on innovation based economy. So these are all the areas where some of you can research. So that is where contemporary legal scholarship needs to reflect more. So five areas I would float. You can create your groups, maybe daily after the workshop, Bismi ma'am can reserve half an hour or one hour, ask them to chat their ideas form group between kerala university and delhi university it is scholar based theme based rather than university based which works out fantastic and also junior senior level because juniors are very good in uh, uh, synthesizing reading and updating and in their thinking process is also very modern so these areas uh, that i have brought to you if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer almost all resources i used but uh, some of you want to start with the very impacting Scopus. Economic and Political Weekly could be the best place. It is Scopus 3 journal because Scopus 4, four quartile journals are not reliable. They may be removed anytime. Scopus 3 cannot be. And EPW has been a long standing Scopus. EPW is where always discuss the law with the developments, case studies, and case laws in a manner that interdisciplinary scholars can read. How many of you have read at least one CPW's law content? Not many read beyond these uh, AIRs and others. So please read these journals and, and follow the styles, as I told you, inspirational, motivational. So in EPW, any new law you can discuss, 
you can uh, highlight the problem. So I've got a few articles I use. For example, there was one article which was written about domestic violence prevalence in Dalit community women. Now, what is new in the article in terms of quality? What is new is applying DV Act to the Dalit community. And she gives a scan of literature of the articles written about domestic violence in the past. And all these articles were looking at efficiency, efficacy, or gender analysis in general. It was not looked at in terms of specific experience of these uh, communities. So it's article. So she shows how there is a lack of knowledge or uh, publication in this area. And then she structured her article by visiting 100 households in a particular locality. And then she, uh, we call it as converged it, or we call it triangle, triangulated it with the, the findings of the police, the state administration, newspaper articles, and other status. And she concluded how Domestic Violence Act needs to be specially looked at from the perspective of such communities which are fringe dwellers who don't have much access to the legal remedies and justice mechanism because of their innate economic and other inabilities in uh, and how gender inequality is prevalent in these communities as much as in other communities. So this is, and then the drunkenness and uh, Physical labor, you know, physical labor pushes people into drunkenness because they have to be ready for the labor next day. So that drunkenness aggravates, the stress aggravates, stress of poverty itself aggravates violence. So these points she had brought in. So such interdisciplinary, multifocal viewpoints are always respected in EPW, where you can have a four-page article, eight-page article, 20-page article. So we published one on a Jija Ghosh case when the case came. So that was our first scopus, me and my one PhD researcher. She was offloaded the, I think it was one of the flights, you know, um, I think it was South Indian flight. Uh, so uh, uh, court awarded uh, 10 lakh rupees as compensation. So the title, look at the title we gave, because the crux of the article was uh, the special treatment of access and accommodation to the disabled is their right, and it's uh, not charity. So the title of our article was From Charity to Empowerment, Discourse on Disability, right, disability Rights in the Light of Jija Ghosh Case. So that article was accepted. We had to wait for three months. But how you recast it and make it readable, make it attractive, you know, there was, uh, there were, uh, if you look at these famous uh, writers, uh, journal writers, they always uh, look at it uh, in terms of making it attractive. So they draw on literature for their title. For example, uh, um, uh, on uh, drug uh, prohibition, uh, articles which are written, why uh, cannabis cannot be legalized? Because by then it was legalized in California, but in other parts of the world, it was not legalized. So the article was, is cannabis dress rehearsal for hard drugs? Debating legalization of cannabis. So debating means denying legalization, accepting legalization, supporting legalization, looking at its pros and cons with medical and other evidence. So, and impact on the youth, social impact, criminalization, and criminal cartels taking control of drug distribution. So this is the kind of article that was written. So it will be very interesting for you to create a collection, your own uh, dossier of different collections in your field of study or specialization or research, and then model your uh, titles after that. I'm not saying copy paste, but it inspires human ingenuity can give so many possibilities. Uh, so, you know, there was this uh, study on uh, MGR. It's a not law. It was on MGR's evolution as an actor. It was by Pandian, a scholar. And the title of the book was Image Trap. So how the image of MGR as a macho, as all in one, you know, kind of thing, how it became a trap as the matinee hero. And uh, all kinds of films were analyzed, his roles were analyzed, and the impact it was creating on the audience was analyzed. 
in law we have i mean upendra bakshi brings this um, he is developing um, new ideas you know he is uh, calling it as um, uh, democracy or um, uh, demos prudence he has started this idea of demo, demos prudence it is not just uh, knowledge created about law by judges or jurists but by people so demos prudence so such uh, innovative way of devising the language as a tool also helps you to make a mark as a scholar so with that i conclude my deliberation with you if you have questions you are welcome i hope i have catered to the need which bismi madam had in mind while uh, designing this workshop and inviting me and i hope i have uh, met your expectations in terms of uh, uh, what you wanted to learn if there are questions direct or in the chat i'll be happy to take uh, i'll just view the chat uh, no uh, there is a request to post but i don't think uh, many people have posted uh, i would love to know the feedback also if possible yeah it's uh, informative yeah thank you shashindran 